I have some new polling to tell you about that shows you a tight general election race between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. In the first, from Quinnipiac University, Biden leads Trump by three points, 48 percent to 45 percent among registered voters. That's within the poll's margin of error. That follows polling this week that shows a neck and neck battle for key swing states. In the latest Bloomberg Morning Consult poll, Trump and Biden are tied at 45 percent in Michigan and Pennsylvania and in Wisconsin. Biden leads by a single point, which is within the margin of error. Very close. With, the, with us, we have special correspondent at Vanity Fair and host of the Fast Politics podcast, Molly Jong Fast. She's an MSNBC political analyst. And also with us this morning, conservative attorney, George Conway, back with us. So uh, also, one more thing. The new mm -hmm. polling also shows that Donald Trump has a big problem well, of course. with women voters. Yeah. In mm -hmm. the Quinnipiac University survey, 60% of women say they plan to vote for Joe Biden compared to just 35% for Trump. If that happens in November, it would be a three-point improvement on Biden's 2020 numbers, a year when women cast more votes than ever before and turned out at higher rates than men. It would also mean a seven-point drop in support for Trump. You know, Molly, uh, it is, it, by the way, you look at these numbers, um, I think we're going to be seeing sort of a post-State of the Union uh, lift for Joe Biden for quite some time because the Republicans are, they're such idiots when, <laughs> when, when it comes to approaching Joe Biden. And again, Newt Gingrich said it after 22, after they were idiots again and underestimated Biden and the Democrats, and they lost. And Gingrich said, you know, we just keep underestimating this guy the same way that Democrats underestimated Eisenhower and Reagan. And they, they, they kept getting beat. So here we go again. And again, we have a special election, not in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. right? Not in the Berkshires. But in Alabama. Oh, wow, yeah. In a Republican yeah. district. Mm -hmm. And a woman on running on IVF, running on women's issues mm -hmm. that impact men. Marilyn too. Lands. Mm -hmm. She wins in a landslide in Alabama. And now you're looking at this polling things. And again, she's going to be on today. We're, we're only in March. We're only in March. And, you know, all these Democrats that have been whining so much. The numbers are showing it's going to be a tight race. But you know what? You, there's a reason the Biden administration, why people in this White House are as confident as they are. They believe they've got a candidate that they can pound politically from now until November. Mm -hmm. And they believe that they have an issue in women's rights, women's health care uh, and democracy that 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 are going to carry them and Democrats to victory. And my God, if you've looked at anything over the past couple of years, you've got to you got to say, well, they know what they're talking about. Yeah, I mean, Alabama is such a great example because they really painted themselves into a corner with this idea that a five-celled embryo is somehow a person. And you saw it stopped IVF in the state. Then the governor indemnified IVF clinics. So that means if you kill a five-celled embryonic person, you are somehow legally okay. I mean, this is, you know, this is what happens, and this has happened a lot with Republican legislation. They sort of never think through the legislation, so they decide embryos are people, and this won't cause any problems, and in fact, it causes problems with birth control and IVF. And now you're seeing, I mean, in Alabama, the Democrat won by 23 points. Like, this is not normal. This is an electorate that is really worried that they're not going to be able to get birth control and IVF and the things that we, you know, these miracles of modern science that we as a, you know, um, that make America great, right? Well, it's not just a miracle of modern science, oh. which is, which again, extraordinary. And I, I don't know a family that's not touched by it, yeah. uh, including our own. And it's just, it's just glorious for moms and dads that don't think they're going to be able to have have babies to be able to have babies. That's the positive side of it as we talk about it. On the negative side, I'm just reading this ABC News That's headline. A, just um, a chilling. 13-year-old 
yeah. rape victim. Let's just stop right there. Mm -hmm. Think about it, moms and dads, grandmoms and granddads. Because of Donald Trump, who has bragged repeatedly that he terminated a woman's right to choose. Because of Donald Trump, young rape victims are having state-forced births. And in this case, a 13-year-old rape victim has baby amid confusion and the DNA over from the state's the baby ban. Actually, is how they convicted the rapist. This little girl was raped mm -hmm. in a yard mm -hmm. and was too scared to talk about it. And her mother only found out about this when she went to the hospital very sick. And then that is when the chaos started for this mom who worked several jobs, was living on the edge, just trying to get by. She noticed her daughter had become withdrawn, was changing. And then, of course, this revelation in the hospital. But there, were all, there was all this confusion. Can you get uh, the abortion health care you need? They didn't know. People were talking to her about her having to leave the state. And this mom didn't have the $1,500 or whatever was necessary to get to another state, literally had to decide on going through with the pregnancy because she didn't understand what was available to her because of all the new laws in place. Mm -hmm. People were giving her the sense that she would have to leave the state to get well, abortion. Well, and, and Molly, doctors, doctors. She doctors. actually would have applied. It actually so, would have applied to her. Yeah, doctors don't understand a lot of times. A lot of times the doctors are scared to perform this because Donald Trump bragged about terminating Roe v. Wade and bragged about sending it to the states. And then the state legislatures, as you said, they make the most extreme bills mm -hmm. to play to their most extreme elements. And you end up having 10-year-old rape victims in Ohio having to flee the state. 13-year-old rape victims here uh, just, just confused having to carry their, their, the, the, the baby to term uh, because they were raped. And this is, this is Donald Trump's America now. This yeah. is Donald Trump's America. And I would add that it is, you know, this post row America is actually not a very safe place to be a pregnant woman. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing doctors. I mean, this Lift Louisiana report out last week showed that in Louisiana, doctors try to treat their, the OBGYNs are trying to treat after 12 weeks because they're worried about getting blamed for miscarriages because before 12 weeks are much more likely to miscarry. I mean, this is crazy. We are already a country that really struggles with maternal fetal health. And it's only getting worse in this post Roe America. And look, in 1973, the reason that Roe v. Wade was, was decided so broadly by a fairly conservative court was because of doctors afraid to treat, afraid to be jailed or fined or lose their licenses. And that's what we're going back to. Shot of New York City. It's a big night tonight. In the Big Apple, it's shaping up to be one of the biggest nights in Democratic politics since President Biden's inauguration. Former Presidents Obama and Clinton will join Biden in New York City for an hours-long fundraiser, including moderated conversations with Stephen Colbert and a lineup of musical performances that include Queen Latifah Lizzo and Ben Platt. I think Jordan Roth. I love Queen Help Latifah. Put that together. Jordan did that? Jordan oh, did, I yeah. love it. It's yeah. gonna that means it's gonna be amazing. Yeah, uh, the massive effort, which is expected to host over five thousand people, has already raised over twenty-five million dollars for Biden, according to his re-election campaign. In addition to the main event, First Lady Dr. Jill Biden will be hosting an after party at Radio City Music Hall with an additional 500 guests. Obama and Clinton are trying to expand Biden's cash advantage over former President Trump. In the latest filings, Biden's soared over the former president with a whopping $40 million cash advantage. And the great news uh, is that um, Biden voters won't have to pay any legal bills for Joe Biden. He uses the money for the campaign. Yeah. He doesn't have like, no. you know, massive allegations, 88 counts. Well, he, he doesn't also, like he doesn't have family members inside the DNC making sure that the money that comes in goes straight to legal bills first. They have that set up at the RNC and man, that's going to cause some real problems. But
People are still talking about this. Former President Trump is now trying to make money by selling $60 Bibles. <laughs> Trump selling the Bible, yeah. It's like if Mike Pence was selling copies of Fifty Shades of Grey. You know? <laughs> yep, the guy who's about to go on trial for paying hush money to cover up an affair with a porn star is selling Bibles. And because it's a Trump Bible, most of the Ten Commandments are blacked out. <laughs> Now, this has come as no surprise to anyone. Making a profit is Trump's religion. As his Jesus famously said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle if you pay me four easy installments of 1995. <laughs> Act now. Disciples are standing by. It's just, yeah. Welcome back to Morning Joe. Willie. Willie. Uh, I mean, I had a pastor text me a couple days ago. Is there no bottom to this? No, no. He is, he is, he is cross-promoting a Bible. Uh, and by the way, a Bible he knows absolutely nothing about. No. Mixed with the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. And Lee Greenwood. Not a Christian. Not I mean, at all. it's crazy. It's just crazy. But it's really, I guess it's not crazy if you're Donald Trump. No. And, and, yeah. and cult, cult, cult members. Who, <laughs> idols, Jeremiah. You want to talk about the Bible, Jeremiah talks about people who follow idols and make themselves worthless. Jeremiah holds up pretty well in 2024. Yeah, and I mean, $60, first of all, he wants you to pay for what he calls his Bible. There is no your Bible or my Bible or Rev's Bible or anybody else's. It's my Bible, 60 bucks, and we all know where the money is going. They say it's not going to the campaign, but there are an awful lot of legal bills <laughs> that right. need to be paid. Pair that with the $400 sneakers. He's used cars wow. next. Who knows what he's going to sell? But I think we should defer to the Reverend Al Sharpton on questions of, yeah. the, of the Bible here. Um, blasphemy comes to mind. What else when you well, see Donald blasphemy Trump? Blasphemy certainly comes to mind. But I think that people ought to realize how offensive this is yeah. to those of us that really believe in the Bible. He's doing this during Holy Week. Yeah. I mean, tomorrow is Good Friday. Sunday is Easter. Of all of the times you want to hustle using the Bible, why would you do it during Holy Week, which is really a, a, a spit in the face of people that really believe in the Bible from a Christian point of view? I wonder how many ministers, uh, conservative evangelicals, that will go to their pulpit tomorrow or on Sunday Easter using the Trump Bible. Uh, I, they ought to be defrocked if they would even try and act like this is nothing but what it is, and that's a hustle. And, you know, when I was growing up, uh, I, I was licensed in the Pentecostal church, the largest black Pentecostal church at the time, Washington Temple, very respected. But there was a, every once in a while a huckster evangelist would come through, and uh, they would sell blessed oils and blessed cloth. Let's remember, this man has sold the uh, pieces of his garments that he was went to court with, Yes. He has sold sneakers now, gold sneakers with red bottoms, now Bibles. I mean, if he's not like the old hustlers that used to use tents to go on uh, old ladies that believed that this was the way to God, then I don't know what is. And for those in the evangelical community not to come out and say, wait a minute, during Holy Week, that's a step too far. Makes us wonder where their commitment really is. And that's the thing, guys. If you have no values or principles, it's all the same stuff. It's a Bible or it's sneakers or it's water or it's steak. It's all the same to Donald Trump, a way to make some money. Yeah. And, and, and David French. He needs it. Yeah. And David French wrote on threads, uh, said, if you call yourself a Christian and this doesn't disturb you, I don't know what to say. Yeah. I mean, you just can't, you can't make sense of it. Joining Less than 24 hours after he was hit with a gag order in his upcoming hush money trial, Trump has repeatedly lashed out again at the judge overseeing the case. On True Social yesterday, Trump called the judge biased and conflicted. He also criticized the judge's daughter, saying she used an image of him behind bars as a social media profile picture. But that claim is false. The New York state court system says the account is bogus. Under the gag order imposed this week, Trump must refrain, refrain from discussing witnesses, jurors, lawyers, court staff, and employees in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. The order did not mention the judge and his family. So George Conway, technically not a violation of the gag order because he's going after the judge, 
not witnesses, potential jurors. But Donald Trump continues down this road to no one's surprise, lying about a fake Twitter account that he thinks he saw. Yep, lying, uh, intimidating, bullying. That's that's Donald Trump at his worst, and that's Donald Trump always. And he's always going to find the one thing that he can do if there's a list of things that he cannot do and that he doesn't think he can get away with. And there's, he has no compunction about it. He has no conscience. And at some point, I think, though, he can't help himself. He's going to end up violating the gag order. And that's going to be an interesting, an interesting moment. I mean, he's arguably already violated some other gag orders. But we'll, we're going to see him pushing the envelope as much as as possible, particularly when he actually gets into that courtroom on April 15th and has to sit there and listen to all the evidence against him and listen to the arguments against him. Yeah, you know, Jonathan Lemire, you know, we, we, we've been talking a lot about all the money that Donald Trump is going to have to pay. You look at look at how much of it is self-inflicted, about 90 million dollars of that is self-inflicted with E. Jean Carroll. That case was over. And he just started defaming her again. You know, so he the, the case is over. He pays, I don't know, five, ten million dollars. There's a lot of money for other people, but Trump would say not for himself. And then he ignores everything, starts defaming her again, <laughs> repeatedly. And this time the court comes back and they make a decision. I think the jury made a decision. We've got to do something to stop him from defaming this woman, because you would think a five or ten million dollar verdict would be enough. But no, it wasn't. And so, so much of this whining, I mean, as is always the case with Donald Trump, so much of his mo problems are self-inflicted problems. And here we go again. So I don't want to hear people say, oh, well, if, if he ends up going to jail for a couple of nights for, 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 for violating this order, you know, it's on Donald Trump. It's on him. The, 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 the rest of us. All 340 million Americans would not get away with what Donald Trump get away. Mark that down. 340 no million of us would not get away with trashing a judge. Not even close. And and lying about the judge's daughter. I I I. For all the I practiced law for a few a few years, and I practiced law long enough to know that if you did something like this in Northwest Florida you would be sent to jail for a night or two to think about it. Yeah, it is a two-tiered system of justice, but Donald Trump's got the advantage, unlike what is what he always says. And we should be clear, this gag order is largely because of worries about threats of violence. Uh, there are many people attached to this. This trial and others have received threats from Trump supporters. This is an effort here to try to tamp that down, to try to get Trump to stay quiet. Um, you know, but he, he can't help himself. As you just chronicled, uh, he has gotten himself in so much trouble because he simply can't stop talking or truthing on his uh, social media site. Uh, and Rev, and that's sort of what, first of all, that's going to have implications for his criminal trial. And I think we've been living with this for so long now that Trump is in legal trouble. It's still going to be jarring when he actually, as a former president, the first former president, to sit in a courtroom in about a month's time and face criminal charges. Uh, but it also, that's the political problem for Trump. It's that he can't stop talking. Famously, he was disciplined for like the last two weeks of the 2016 campaign, and that did help him as he came back and to beat Hillary Clinton. But the Biden campaign, they firmly believe the more Trump talks, the more he gets himself in trouble, legally and politically, the better it is for the president. No, and I think they're right. I think that Trump uh, will continue talking, and they will continue, the uh, Biden and Democrats, uh, to benefit from it uh, because he appears unhinged to the voters. But I think you must realize that Donald Trump wants to provoke a confrontation. He wants to play martyr, and he wants them to uh, answer him, come down on him, so he can play to his base, see what they're doing to me. Not that he's provoked it. I mean, to attack a judge's daughter and a judge who just said, don't do these kinds of things. And, and as you rightfully say, with violence being threatened, I mean, we're not doing this to stop free speech. We're doing this because people are being threatened and potential jurors will be concerned. I think it shows the irresponsibility uh, of someone that you would want to put back in the, uh, behind the chair in the Oval Office. It's absolutely, uh, to me, frightening.
Well, George Conway and Molly, George, you first. I mean, I think, first of all, uh, the reason for these gag orders, as uh, Jonathan Lemire pointed out, is because of the fear of violence, uh, of retribution. Um, and, and Donald Trump uh, is proven on that point in many different ways. We could talk for four hours about all the different ways he has threatened people. And then, of course, we have January 6th. And I just have to say, I was watching one of his networks because I like to see what Trump voters are hearing from places that call themselves news networks. And they were talking about January 6th in a discussion, in a discourse about us, actually, and saying that we want to put out there that January 6th was more than just a little thing. And that is the problem I, I, with I, the discourse. Let's just come out and say it. <laughs> you, hear on, you can hear on Fox News people saying that nothing was wrong with you January can, can 6th have some, for the most part. Yeah, if someone it, it believes it was a big little deal. thing. And, and others Fox saying, you know, that network, they, they actually sit there. And people that watch that network actually think January 6th was an important event, and you're you're sitting there. Wait a second, it, were there not more than a little? Were thing. there Nazi newspapers in nineteen <laughs> in the nineteen thirties saying you know Crystal Knox? There are some people who actually think that was a bad thing. This is the fact that Donald Trump has numbed people so much that the same people who said it was a horrible thing on January the seventh are now coming back into the cult, back into the folds, going, you know, some people actually are stupid enough to say that that was a really terrible thing. Mind-blowing to me, mind-blowing to me. That, that can't that, be the that, debate. That, that, that they actually uh, are, are able to say that uh, on a network that's paid dearly for election lies. Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely. I mean, they've created their own little bubble. It's a little bubble that Trump lives in and that all of the people who, a lot of the people who support him live in. But the question is, uh, what what do the people in the middle think? And And the people in the middle don't want that chaos. They don't really want that chaos. They're not thinking about Donald Trump quite yet as much as all of us do because they're not it's it's only it's only march and so i think that you know the strategy that the biden campaign has which is going to be to keep pounding on him and keep pointing out the crazy keep pointing out the abnormal in donald trump is the right one because it's going to actually have as i as i like to say kind of a a feedback effect the more you pound on him and they have the the resources and it seems like they have the idea that they're going to really pound on him in a way that they did not in 2020 you provoke him and you get more of the kind of conduct that you can point to and say, this man should not be anywhere near the steering wheel of an ice cream truck, let alone the Oval Office. So I think, you know, I think that the dynamics are going to work in favor of, I mean, in, they're going to hurt Donald Trump as he becomes more and more exposed and, and faces more and more pressure from these criminal cases. Yeah, I, I, I think so. And again, the fact that that they are living in a bubble, that Donald Trump's living in a bubble. This reminds me so much, Molly, of 2012, where Mitt Romney and his team watched Fox News and nothing else. They looked at websites that told them they were up by 11 points mm -hmm. in the Gallup poll. They believed until election night uh, in what they were hearing inside that bubble. It's happening again. And whether you're a fascist or a cult member or an insurrectionist or a weirdo or just a freak uh, or just a confused person that has stumbled in the wrong direction, um, that is a bubble that has led to Republicans losing in 2017, mm -hmm. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. 23. So, so, so little idiots over there that say I'm a left winger or something. First of all, I've got a 95% ACU rating. I'm more conservative than any of them. I was part of Congress and a big part of the reason, if anybody was around, they'll tell you that we balanced the budget for four years in a row for the first time and the only time in a hundred years. And so when I say all of this and say, wake up, you're in a bubble. I'm saying it as a conservative. And, and these cult members 
We'll look at anybody. We'll look at Liz Cheney, who I think also has a 95% ACU rating. We'll look at me. We'll look at George Conway, who liberals hated most of his life. We'll look at all these other people who gave their lives to the conservative cause that are saying, wake up, wake up. You're going to lose. This guy is a huckster. Well, and they don't listen. Instead, they try to shoot the messenger mm. who's trying to help like them. And thank God, right, because this is this very autocratic vision for America. And, you know, look, we have one party that is not believing right now in the tenets of democracy. Liz Cheney, George Conway, they're doing this because they're worried about American democracy, right? This is no longer about left or right. This is about our system of government versus some other fever, Trumpy fever dream. And so I do, you know, again, I, George and I are friends. We disagree vehemently on many, 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 many things, including abortion, which we fight about all the time, and judges, but, uh, and the Supreme Court. But uh, we also <laughs> agree in democracy, right? Do we fight about the Supreme Court all the time? This is so good. Yeah. Well, this is what it's all about, actually, right here. And this is what is lacking in our discourse, our right. political discourse. So we heard them fighting. Yeah, but the they fight. And the Republicans, <laughs> that's true. They're, and the Republicans fight. that you named, you yeah. know, their crime in their party is that they spoke their mind. And the problem that we're seeing right yeah. now is you have a lot of people on the media that leans to the right and has that take is that they are right now cutting down people they, for speaking their mind. They, don't they are the right. right now cutting down people who speak their mind despite who pays them. There's an old saying that behind every successful man there's a surprised mother-in-law. <laughs> well, well, I can tell you that this week, that's been particularly true. Oh, wow, what a sweet moment. Former U.S. Senator. And vice presidential candidate Joe Lieberman has mm. died at the age of 82. It's hard to believe. No, it, it was really shocking news it when really. it happened yesterday. Yeah. His family released a statement announcing his death due to complications from a fall. The four-term senator represented Connecticut from 1989 to 2006 as a Democrat, then switched to independent before retiring in 2013. Lieberman was the first Jewish candidate on a major party's presidential ticket when Al Gore picked him as his running mate in the 2000 presidential election. Lieberman's legacy would be marked by his independent streak. He lost the Democratic primary in Connecticut in 2006 because of his support of the Iraq war, but still won the election as an independent. In 2008, he supported his longtime friend and Republican, the late Senator John McCain, in his election against President Barack Obama. Lieberman was also a founding chairman of the No Labels, the centrist third party group. He disagreed with his party. He left his party, but there was never a lack of civility. Right. In fact, he brought, um, I think he brought the discourse to a, a, a new level. Um, a level that we have lost today. We certainly have. He moved. He he moved to the center, and uh, he always was a bit of a centrist, and he he always remained civil, even with those who he may have engaged in political combat with. And on that note, why don't we bring in one of those those men who was a fierce competitor of Joe Lieberman and later a great friend, and tomorrow, uh, of course, will be memorializing him at, at a service. We have Democratic Governor Ned Lamont of Connecticut. He ran against Senator Lieberman in 2006. And again, speaking at his memorial service tomorrow. Governor, we'll just turn it over to you. Tell us, tell us about Joe Lieberman. Hey, Mika, Joe, really nice to see you. I wish it was uh, happier circumstances. Um, look, he and Chris Dodd were a heck of a team uh, representing our state uh, for many years in the U.S. Senate. Um, as you point out, he's a man of um, great conviction and principle and um, always with civility. And uh, he and I have both moaned uh, what's happened over the last uh, 15 years. You know, we 
you know, we started uh, on the wrong foot. You know, I, I challenged him in a primary. He strongly supported the president's uh, war in Iraq, President Bush, and I strongly opposed it. And um, we had a battle royal about that. And when the race was over and he won, we shook hands and, um, you know, agreed to move forward together. And um, I did get to see him just uh, a few months ago. We were at the uh, Alfalfa Club, which is a dinner in Washington, D.C., and we caught up and said, look, uh, Senator Labor, we didn't agree about the war in Iraq, but we certainly agree about what we ought to be doing in Ukraine. And I think um, President Trump's uh, supporters and House of Representatives are, you know, feckless and wimpy when it comes to standing up to um, Putin and standing up for uh, the Ukrainian defense. And yeah. he said, here's what we could agree upon, uh, Ned, and we agreed to stay in touch. And unfortunately, in touch is going to be tomorrow at the memorial service. You know, you know, Governor, uh, you and he share so much in common. I, I remember when you were first running for governor of Connecticut, me hearing from all of my Connecticut friends how radical you were going to be and how left wing. And it was just so toxic in Hartford. And after you got elected, uh, I said, how's, how's he doing? And they, they, they were shocked from day one. Uh, you reached out, you work with Republicans, you don't vilify them. And and that's something that we we saw in in Senator Lieberman. He would do the same thing with John McCain when with Lindsey Graham when Lindsey Graham was interested in such things. Uh, it was uh, it is pretty remarkable. But as you know very well, it's a great way to actually get things done for the American people. Exactly right, Joe. I, I think Senator Lieberman was happy looking up at Connecticut, the fact that, uh, you know, sort of following his lead in terms of civility and independence. Uh, we've worked on both sides of the aisle. We got a budget um, passed that was uh, almost unanimous, uh, trying to work together, trying to get people at the table. It stands in um, contrast to what's going on in Washington, D.C., which I know is so dismaying to the senator. So, Ned, uh, Governor, sorry, um, as I uh, just remember at this point right now it's my dad's birthday today i just remembered oh my um which i was thinking of my dad because my dad was uh, similar to lieberman and they they were friends because of their search for the conversation that led to civil discourse that led to appreciation and acceptance of one another and i wonder as you're thinking of how to put it into words, I know you'll be speaking at his memorial service at his funeral. Um, how do you put into w words the legacy of Joe Lieberman in that respect? I'd say, uh, like your dad, Nika, um, he was um, certainly a man of great principle and conviction and uh, stuck to his guns. And um, mm. believe me, we didn't always agree. But um, he never he never wavered during our you know challenge uh, back in 2006. He could have um, called for a negotiated solution or changed uh, his position on Iraq, and he never did. And um, I didn't either. And that's why we had a um, a good battle there. But more importantly, the fact that we could be friends afterwards and friends uh, low these many years later. I think uh, that's what we miss in Washington D.C. And I think uh, really that's what a lot of us remember about Joe Lieberman. You know, he and John McCain, as you point out, um, and Lindsey Graham, the three amigos, um, uh, them working uh, different sides of the aisle was uh, something to watch. You don't see that often in Washington these days. No, you don't. Well, Democratic Governor Ned Lamont of Connecticut, we thank you for uh, uh, coming on the show this morning. At the very last minute last night, we reached out and, and, and thank you very much for responding positively and coming in. Tuesday, a court in Moscow extended his pretrial detention for a fifth time. According to a statement from the court's news service, Evan has been ordered now to stay in prison until the end of June. Joining us now, the publisher of The Wall Street Journal and CEO of Dow Jones, Almar Latour. Mr. Latour, thanks for being here. Uh, I know how agonizing the last year has been for all of you in your organization, particularly the staff and friends of Evan at The Wall Street Journal. Um, can you speak to how much engagement you've been able to have with Russia through diplomacy, through the State Department, and just to kind of keep tabs on Evan? 
Well, keeping tabs of Evan is very difficult, and uh, an autocracy, uh, uh, keeping touch with uh, with Russia is just very complicated, not just for us, but also for the U.S. government. Um, visits to his uh, prison, uh, Le Fortovo, um, uh, are sparse. So once a week uh, from our lawyers, our Russian lawyers, uh, who incidentally are under an NDA. They cannot speak about this case to us, even though mm. uh, they're working for us. Um, U.S. consulate, the U.S. embassy, uh, from time to time, uh, uh, pays visits. Now, there's correspondence. His friends correspond with him. Uh, there's writing back and forth. Uh, his parents went over to Russia uh, just once, some for a, a couple of minutes during one of those hearings that we've now uh, uh, grown accustomed to, uh, where Evan is yeah, in, in a glass cage. And so uh, it's it's hard to really penetrate uh, uh, through uh, his prison walls and, and really understand what's going on there. We're told he's in good spirits. Uh, we're told that he's reading and that during the one hour that he is allowed to be outside, he exercises, he has a cellmate uh, with whom he converses, and, and um, he, uh, he, he is resilient. But that's what we're told. Are there moments of hope? I mean, obviously, this is very discouraging when you get an extension of three months now, pretrial detention now going into June, and, you know, there'll probably be another one after that. I guess the same question that George Stephanopoulos asked Evan's mother, what gives you hope as an organization that you can bring Evan home? Well, the support has been so tremendous and uh, in the course of the past year. That has only grown. And if there is anything uh, that, that drives cases like these, public support makes a big difference. You have to uh, help make a case like this, Evan's case, a priority. And in order to do that, you have to have that groundswell. You have to have that spotlight. And so the fact that that spotlight has not gone away, uh, the fact that the administration uh, speaks with some regularity to uh, uh, their commitment to free Evan, uh, that gives me uh, hope. There, throughout this year, there have been moments of intense hope and our ups and downs, and we just got to live with that. At some point, there's going to be a, a circuit breaker, and he's going to get out. So to continue awareness, now the Wall Street Journal is uh, currently engaging a 24-hour live stream readings of, of Evan's work uh, to keep the spotlight on what's going on as that year anniversary approaches. You, you started to hint about the Biden administration and their efforts. Can you just give us a little details as to what they say they're trying to do, what sort of hopes they have? To, to broker a, a, a deal here, which is made that much more complicated because of what's happening in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, so I, I can't give specifics about uh, the sort of day to day, but uh, the president has, has spoken out in the open about his support and his commitment to bring Evan home. That has happened at, uh, multiple times throughout the past year. Uh, there is intense involvement from the White House. I'm personally convinced of that. Our team. Uh, uh, interacts uh, with with the White House on this. Uh, the State Department is heavily involved. There's a special department uh, within the State Department, uh, the, the Special Presidential Envoy for Hostage Affairs. That's a small team that's dedicated to cases like these. So there's a lot of activity. That's the official diplomacy. That's the administration. And then there's also what I would call private diplomacy. Um, a lot of people who are unseen uh, either in official capacity or unofficial capacity, working on behalf of, uh, of Evan. Uh, and so you take all of that together, there is a lot of activity. That said, until Evan is out, right, this is binary. He's either in prison or, or he's not. And so, uh, so far, um, you know, we're, we're not done with that job, and the administration is not done with that job. Mika has a question for you, Mika. Uh, um, there's so many constraints that, that you have that you're working with in this situation, and I know uh, you had mentioned it's important to raise awareness uh, about this for people who uh, may, may be able to lend their support or just keep the word out there. Tell us the different ways in which you are doing that, how you are stepping up um, and amplifying the effort to raise awareness about Evan. Yeah, thank you, Mika. Uh, for anyone at home who uh, who wants to contribute, uh, there's a, a slew of options available on wsj.com forward slash Evan. Um, that's where you see how you can write a letter to him uh, or participate in, in the many, many other actions that are taking place. There's a readathon uh, taking place today. There uh, was a show of force uh, yesterday in, in, uh, in front of our office. And so there are many actions uh, so around the clock uh, uh, taking place. And so that's that's the place to check it. 
publisher of the Wall Street Journal, Amar Latour. Thank you so much for coming on the Thanks show this here. morning. Please come back. Keep us posted. Thank you for your support. We appreciate it. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.